Hi, hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'm, I wanted to talk a little bit about a challenge or an issue that I've been thinking a lot about recently, um, how we use data in storytelling and in advocacy specifically. Um, but before I go too much into uh, my talk, I actually wanted to share with you a, a small story of my own that hopefully highlights why I think this issue is so important and deserves um, more thought than I think we give it right now. Um, so as you might be able to tell from my accent, I'm not from around here. I grew up in the United Kingdom. Um, I've lived in Berlin for the last five years and I'm currently based in New York. Um, all that to say, I really value my freedom of movement and actually a lot of things that the European Union stand for. So, when, um, so earlier this year there was a referendum on whether the, U the UK should leave the EU or whether they should remain a member. Um, and I was in Berlin for most of the kind of lead up to the referendum. And a couple of weeks before, no, the week before the, the referendum actually took place, I, um, I totally freaked out. And I kept seeing all these, all these bad campaigning tactics being used. And so I bought a ticket to England. Um, and I arrived the day before the referendum took place. And on the day of the referendum, I went out onto the streets. This is me with my Vote Remain t-shirt that I thought would be a great memory of the day. It's actually stuffed at the back of my wardrobe and I can't really bring myself to look at it. Um, so on this day, I went out um, in the village of Didsbury near Manchester where I grew up. Um, and I was trying to talk to people about whether they were voting and why. And I just wanted to kind of have a dialogue with people about it. Um, and one conversation in particular really stood out to me. So um, I met a woman who was standing outside a florist and she was having a cigarette and I approached her and said, hey, would you mind talking to me a little bit? Um, and so we, we started talking about the, the referendum, of course. Um, and she said, you know, I've not, I don't really care. I've not really been following the campaign. It's just a bit overwhelming. I'm not into news, current affairs. I really don't care. And I've not really got a strong opinion on it either way. So I was like, that's perfect, let me tell you, let me tell, I've, I've got things to say, don't worry, I, I've got all this stuff. And she interrupted me and she said, but you know, the one thing that is making me think I'll vote leave is that I really like the National Health Service. Um, and for those of you who don't know, the National Health Service in the UK is the way that we all get free healthcare. You don't have to pay, it's just assumed that if you need healthcare, you can get healthcare without paying. It's fantastic, trust me. Um, so, and she said, yeah, I, I just really like the NHS. And I was like, oh, me, me too. I love free healthcare. I think it's great. And she said, but you know what? If we leave the EU, the NHS will get 350 million pounds a week extra. And I was like, what? You, you said you haven't followed any of the campaigns. Like, how do you know this number? And she was referring to this, uh, this campaign slogan advertisement that was one of the first um, that the Leave campaign used back in April. Um, let's give our NHS the 350 million pounds the EU takes every week. That's a lie. That's like just blatantly not true. It's just not true. Um, and somehow she had, despite not paying any attention, not knowing anything about the entire campaign on either side, she knew this number. So I tried saying to her, it's not true. It's, it's, I, it's, I promise it's not true. And she said, look, who am I going to believe? Some random woman who's come to me on the street or the media, politicians, a bus, the former mayor of London, by Boris Johnson, who, who went around with this, thank you, I'm with you, whoever did that, I, yes. Uh, oh, it's the British guy, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and she said, you know, who am I gonna believe, some random woman on the street or everyone else? It's like, mm, yeah, I, yeah, I can't really argue with that, but like, just trust me, it's not true. Um, so she, we ended up talking about it a little bit and nothing I could say would sway her from this belief that 350 million pounds a week would go to the NHS if we left the EU. Um, and I, I eventually gave up and went away just thinking a lot about this conversation and, um, and I saw her later that day and she couldn't really look me in the eye, which made me think that she probably had voted leave. Um, and it turns out, you know, as many of you know, the, uh, when the leave campaign won, we. Britain decided to leave the EU. Uh, um, the, the people who'd been saying all this just hours afterwards said, ah, nah, actually, we didn't mean it. Um, we did, it, was, it, was a, it wasn't a promise. It was a thing that could happen, and it won't happen. Um, and this obviously isn't the reason that everyone voted for leave, but the fact that I, even just during that day, I met three other people who 
had voted leave purely because of this promise, just purely because of this number that had stuck in their minds. And it really made me think about how we use numbers when we're telling stories and the, the politics and the ethics of what we're saying. Um, but I don't want to get too much into the murky world of political campaigning and lies, especially not given where I am right now. Far be it from me. <laughs> I'm new to this country. I don't, I don't want to get into that. Um, I want to talk about using data in stories for good causes, for social change, for positive social change specifically. Um, so I work for an organization called The Engine Room, a nonprofit organization. Um, we support others working in social change to use technology and data more effectively. Um, and I work on a program called the Responsible Data Program, um, through which we look at the ethical, legal, privacy, security challenges that come with using data in new and more ways than before. Um, so at the Engine Room and with the Responsible Data Program, we, don't, we work on issues ranging from kind of the data concerns of human rights defenders who are working in politically restrictive countries to understanding the privacy concerns of farmers when it comes to agriculture technology. So we're completely sector agnostic, um, but we do believe that for a positive long-term impact, thinking thoughtfully and responsibly about how you use data, how you manage it, and what you do with it is really, really essential. Um, so we work with lots of people who are doing advocacy and storytelling. Um, and one of these, uh, this thing that I've been seeing a lot over the past few years is data, people talking about data-driven advocacy with this belief that using numbers to, to highlight key parts of your story will strengthen it and will get people's attention more. And that's kind of the thing that I've been struggling with a little bit. Um, so I want to give you a couple of examples of how uh, data has been used in stories and has had um, unexpected, unexpected results. Uh, so the first example is around the issue of rape and sexual violence in the country of Liberia. Um, so sexual violence was a big issue during the last civil war, which ended in 2003. Um, and there were all these, um, all these reports both at the time and over the following years, and even as recently as last week, which said that around the up to three quarters of women in Liberia have been raped. Now that's a huge, that's huge, that's a huge number. That's 75%, I mean, that last one, you know, one major survey found that 75% of women had been raped, and this was in a New York Times op-ed. Um, and it, it's, I mean, these are three of many. This, this statistic of 75% of women and girls in Liberia have been raped is, is very well spread across the internet. Um, and if you think about it for more than, I don't know, five seconds, you think, really? Like 75%, that's huge. And is that really true? Turns out it's, it's not true. Um, it's really not true. It's, it's a complete lie. Um, so, these, um, this last week, after, so a new report came out recently from, um, I think, a UN agency that said, that used this st statistic again. And these two data scientists, Dara K. Cohen and Amelia Hoover Green, who um, Amelia works with the Human Rights Data Analysis Group, who actually sit just around the corner here. Um, and they've influenced a lot of my thinking around this topic. Um, they wrote this piece last week in the Washington Post where they debunked this figure. And they've been debunking this figure for years. Um, so it turns out, just to give you some background on where this figure came from, it turns out it comes from a study done on 412 women and girls, which is already a tiny amount. All of the women and girls had been identified to take part in this sample, in this survey, because they had said they were victims of sexual violence. So the type of sexual violence that these 412, that 75% of these 412 girls had experienced was rape but they had all already said that they had experienced sexual violence, which is a world away from 75% of women and girls in an entire country. Um, and obviously, it can't be kind of extrapolated to mean that, well, anything, really. But it paints a, a really different picture, um, despite clearly the motivations here being kind of good. You wanted, they wanted to raise awareness of sexual violence I'm all for that, you know, raising awareness, getting people's attention, getting resources directed to a really important cause. That's, can't argue with that. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about why, what does it take to, what does it mean when we take people's goodwill 
if we're basing that on essentially a lie. Um, and one other example that's not quite as stark but uh, has some really interesting nuances to it is the way that um, people are reporting on and uh, campaigning around the number of people that have been killed in Syria. Um, so there are, there are loads of different data sources. So earlier this year I did a series of case studies um, for the Responsible Data Program called uh, Responsible Data Reflection Stories that looked at the challenges that come from using data in new ways. Um, and this was one of the case studies that I looked at with the help of the Human Rights Data Analysis Group. So it turns out there are all these, I mean, and that's not an exhaustive list, there are all these different groups that are gathering data on the number of people who've been killed in Syria. Um, all of those groups have different political aims and they're trying to do different things. Um, and there's also so many personal human decisions that go into coding that data. So um, and a data analysis an analyst at Human Rights Watch, Brian Root, wrote this really nice piece that dives more into this issue called Numbers Are Only Human. Um, and he talked about the decisions that it takes to, when you have, say, a body on the floor with a gun next to it, to say whether it's a regime fighter or a rebel fighter or it's a guy that happens to be lying next to a gun who's never actually picked up a gun in his life or someone else, someone has to make that decision and, and they have, a, they have you know, bias and reasons to be making certain decisions and to be coding data in certain ways. Um, so there are all these human decisions that go into, go into it, all these varying data sources and more. Um, and this is an example of just how different the estimates are. So this is just taken from the area of Tartus um, as collected by four pretty well-known and well-respected data sources. Um, so especially in a conflict as messy as Syria, there are all these uncertainties in getting the data, in coding it, in comprehensive coverage of hard to reach areas. And actually none of the data taken on its own is certain or accurate enough to be, to be cited as fact. Although clearly it is an issue that we want to raise awareness of. Um, and there are campaigning groups that are using data in very different ways. And some of them are using them um, in really specific ways. So this is taken from the Syria campaign. It was done after the, the killings in Paris last, last year. Um, and I don't know if you can see below, they say civilians killed by, and they've got all these different things. And they've got numbers as specific as, you know, 2,669, which is just, it just can't be true. Like, it, it can't be true because we don't know that. But clearly, you know, they want to raise, they want to raise awareness and money for their cause. They want to get resources. Um, and giving a number that's so specific to this cause does, in many people, um, it, it gives a sense of certainty and it gives a sense of assurance that they know what they're talking about, as opposed to another group that might say an estimated 2,000. And th there is like a limited amount of resources and a lim limited amount of people's time and attention that can be kind of dedicated to these kinds of things. Um, but ultimately, you know, they're raising, they're raising awareness and they're raising, they're getting people's attention for this cause that is very good and noble. Um, so my, my question is, does it matter if they're right? Does it matter if these numbers are correct or true? Or is the fact that they're, you know, that they're saying something that might not be that correct, but it's got going towards a broader goal, is that the more important thing? Um, and I've been... I've been struggling a little bit with this question myself, and I think I've come to the answer that, yes, it does matter. <laughs> I think it matters if we're a Pinocchio, not a genie. Um, and I, you know, I've got one more example to highlight, like a really good example of why, uh, why I think it really does matter. So in 2004, the Save Darfur Coalition started a multi-million pound advertising campaign with this message. Um, it's just the last sentence that's particularly important. After three years, 400,000 innocent men, women, and children have been killed. Um, and they put this advertising campaign all around the UK. Um, and their stated mission at the time was to raise public awareness about the ongoing genocide in Darfur. I mean, that's already quite a, a statement to say it's a genocide. That's, that's quite a big one. Um, the thing is, these advertisements were challenged by a group called the European Sudanese Public Affairs Council, 
um, which was very close to the, the Sudanese go or the government in Khartoum and funded by companies who do business in Sudan. Um, so they, they lodged this com complaint against this advertisement and this advertising campaign and said um, that, that no study supported this number of 400,000, so it was, it was an opinion, it wasn't a fact, and you couldn't talk about it like that because that gave this sense of certainty. And the Advertising Standards Authority in the UK upheld this complaint and said, you know, they're actually right. Like, none of the studies you cited could be considered to have a high level of accuracy. You're just, you're, and it kind of discredited, it not only discredited the campaign, but lots of the critics afterwards said it was actually really harmful for the whole, for the whole movement of people, not just this coalition, but the whole movement of people who were trying to get aid into the country, um, policymakers, diplomats, and, um, and it harmed efforts to respond to future humanitarian crises. Um, and that, I think, really highlighted for me that with quantified data, with a specific number, being discredited about what you're saying, it becomes very, very easy. Um, so by, and by putting this number on it, they gave their adversaries the one particular point that they could pick on. And with that, they were able to discredit an entire campaign and actually do more harm than good with this number by exaggerating. Um, and I think this is going to matter more and more in the future. So this is a quote from the editor-in-chief of The Guardian um, from an article that I really like that she wrote after Brexit, saying, facts and reliable information are essential for the functioning of democracy, and the digital era has made that even more obvious. And I think, yeah, not just for the functioning of democracy, but just for, <laughs> just for not, not, being, not make, doing harm to people um, and, not, and actually reaching our goals in a long-term basis rather than just a short-term get people's attention. I think especially in this field, having trust and credibility does really matter beyond just talking to and with your audience. Um, in situations like this, the way that, like post-crisis, when, when these crises have ended, the way that resources are spent can be heavily influenced by major issues of concern during and, well, during that conflict. So exaggerating an issue to make it sound like it's the major thing might get attention and resources at that time, but it might also mean influencing policy in a way that it harmfully affects or ignores another group that just doesn't happen to have um, such a skilled campaigning group working on that issue. Essentially, these, these stories are really messy, um, and quantifying them can oversimplify things. Um, I think, yeah, and as we talked about yesterday, compelling stories are often about very complex issues, but if they're good, they do it in a way that recognizes and incorporates that complexity and that nuance. And in of, often in some of these campaigns, you lose that nuance just by having this number up there. And the other, the other really major problem that I have with, with these kinds of campaigns is that 75% of women getting raped is awful, but so is 5% of women of a certain population, and so is one, one woman getting raped. It doesn't matter how many, really, it's... it's by using data and statistics in this way to shock people into a response by saying it's the worst, it's the most that we've ever had. We really risk ignoring or forgetting the, the people behind the data and the people in that story. Um, so in conclusion, I think there are a few things that I, would, that I think about a lot more now than I have done in the past. Um, why, why data? What role is the data playing in your story? Um, I think if you're, if you're hinging your campaign on a particular story, um, if you, yeah, on a particular piece of data, then you need to be absolutely sure that that is correct. And it's a very different thing, it goes, it's a very different thing to say roughly this much, or to hinge your entire th campaign and say, thanks to this data that we found, we realize that this, pro this problem deserves a campaign around it. Um, and there are many other things that data can do, like getting people's attention and calling them to action, but I think specifically if it's, if it's the thing in your campaign, you need to be sure that that's true. Um, responsibly take, using data takes time and skills, and this actually goes a little bit counter to some of the projects that I've done personally in the past, which really focused on encouraging people to dive in and use data and learn while doing. And I think I still stand by that, but I think there are, it is important to recognize that there are different levels of responsibility that come with different levels of exposure and use. And for those telling stories on important human rights issues, they have a responsibility to really interrogate and investigate statistics that they use. Essentially, nothing, not everything could be quantified, and that's fine. If you can't find data, if you can't 
figure out how to fit it into your story, maybe it's because there are just other ways of telling that story. Um, and ultimately, and I feel like I say this in basically every talk I ever give, um, but, and I work a lot with technology, uh, one of the most compelling ways of telling a story about a large population and spurring people to action remains telling the story of an individual person. It has nothing to do with putting big numbers on things or quantifying things. It's about sharing the stories of individual, real people. Um, yeah, and with all of this, I think data and technology do provide us with certain affordances, but the heart of it, the storytelling, the human aspect of it, it remains the same as it's been forever. Thank you for listening. Thank you.